Hey now, welcome to the City Off Campus podcast with your two favorite co-hosts, Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack McFarland. Today we have Iowa Hawkeyes track and field athlete Jamal Britt on the podcast. How's everything going with you from Oregon? Uh, everything's good. Um, you know, just uh, we have Olympic trials out here. Uh, so it's my first one. I'm very excited to go out there and compete, you know, hopefully uh, a dream of making the team. So pretty much it so can you kind of take us through the process of the training and the competitions that have led up to the olympic trials up to this point yeah so of uh, so even just starting with last year because uh last year was my first uh year at iowa because i transferred from a junior college and you know i came at an awkward time during basically you know the spring semester so didn't really have a serious fall training because I trained by myself and, you know, season got canceled and, you know, we had a start over, but soon, as soon as like basically season started, can you know, season was canceled. I took like a two week break and, you know, basically trained like I was still in season. So, and, you know, throughout official fall training, I've been working with, you know, my teammates and, you know, coach Woody, and we've just been focused on just really uh, conditioning and just technique wise. And, you know, it has paid off to, you know, indoor season and also outdoor season and, you know, you know also Olympic trials uh, that starts tomorrow. So I'm pretty happy with my season and, you know, training wise, because it's just been a long journey for me of where I came from. So, you know, I'm pretty happy of how, you know, things went out so far. I mean, this might sound like a stupid question, but like, how exactly do you condition and really focus on conditioning when like running and doing all that, like, is the sport, like, do you condition by running or do you find other ways of conditioning to get that work in? Uh, really, it's, yeah, I'm really running and also with, you know, weight training and stuff like that, because for example, like start our workouts, like we have like tempo, you know, like hard 300s, actually, that's the workout I do. You know, the conditioning part really hits in when you're like after four, hitting four 300s, you know, most are, so we usually end up with 10 or 12. So usually, you know, when after four 300s, that's when you start getting tired and stuff like that. It's like, okay, now I have to focus on, you know, keeping form and, you know, pushing through the workout and also, being smart of not technically uh, go super hard to tire myself out because the point is to finish the workout. So, so one thing that got me introduced to you and and just you as an athlete was uh, you've been tweeting a lot about how Iowa has hurdle you, and I kind of yeah. want to go in depth about your 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 entire journey to become becoming a hurdler and going to Iowa and all that. So. Like when exactly did you start doing the hurdles and when did like what drew you to it? Yeah, so I wouldn't really say drew me to it, but it all started with my sophomore year of high school. Um, I originally wanted to be like a sprinter, so like 100, 200 runner, maybe quarter miler. But in the back of my mind, I knew like my coach was like, you know, tell me to go to hurdles. And that day came and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to you know, make like the stupid, stupid form or something, make sure I don't uh, be a hurdler. But somehow I end up going to hurdle and, you know, oh, you're a hurdler now. But um, so far, even, you know, continuing out the training through high school, I started to, you know, learn the actual event and prove, you know, shock myself. I was like, okay, maybe I can't do this. You know, maybe I'm not actually a sprinter, straight sprinter, but, you know, I do have speed. But, um, you know, I saw myself as a hurdler, you know, coming down like to my senior year of high school when things basically clicked in. And then how many times did you fall on your face trying to get over the hurdle when you were trying to learn? Because I've even looked at some of the hurdles when I was in high school, just like lining the track and you'd mess around and be like, oh, can I get over one? You just lift your leg and say, man, I don't know if I can do that, like in a running motion. Like how many times realistically did you have to fall in order to like learn and, <laughs> and actually kind of get your, your steps down? Yeah, um, really, uh, I would necessarily I haven't fall just yet, you know, knock on wood, but um, yeah. I, you know, I have like hit hurdles, you know, like with trail leg and stuff like that. I have like knocked down hurdles and stuff, but um, 
really it was more natural once I got into it, especially when it comes to like uh getting into box for the one tens because usually you uh there's a the first uh, first hurdle you have to at least you know be an eight stepper or seven stepper and seven steppers is usually like perfect you know basically like professional level you know not everybody's a seven stepper and I was just naturally a seven stepper in high school you know and some people don't seven step until you know college or even you know the professional level but um yeah really just it was just all natural um obviously there was like technique wise like snapping down because my upper arms were not the best so in time it got uh in time I started fixing it uh and you know now I'm still kind of working on little things but you know it's it's good to a point that you know it's not going to like make me slow and one thing I was wondering about with like the steps, like you've just said, you naturally were a seven step while some are eight at a beginning stage. Is a lot of that based on your own feel and like what is most comfortable for you? Or is it for some, like they need to be a seven or whatever stepper because of how tall or how long their strides are? Is it just kind of like figuring that out during the process of like learning everything? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, it's how basically how you're feeling, you know, like me, I am a tall guy and, you know, lanky. So seven step is, you know, the natural, you know, what feels best for me, you know, even there's been like people in high school, one of my friends from high school, he was a eight stepper originally, but once he got like faster, uh, you know, he starts the seven step, you know, he switches sometimes. I talk to him now and then, but, um, He's a he's trying to stay a seven step because he likes that the most versus you know eight stepping. Is it something hurdlers walk around and say like I'm a seven stepper and then if someone says you, they're an eight stepper you just kind of look at them and you're like I don't talk to you. <laughs> no, I mean oh maybe in high school and stuff like that because <laughs> you know oh I'm a seven step like you seven step like yeah, <laughs> but I mean at like college level and stuff like this, it's like okay you're eight or seven stepper so it's like nothing but high school I would say yeah how that's how it was. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey from high school to junior college to Iowa and how you kind of ended up at Iowa? Yeah, so um, high school, really, uh, I was mainly a football player. So I played football and that was like... What position? Uh, well, I played everything. But, um, Perfect. Uh, but I mostly played wide receiver and cornerback, but mainly cornerback. But I remember like my how I got in track was, you know, one year I was like, okay, I want to do track just to get faster because, you know, that's, you know, basically my how I am as uh, on the football field. I'm a naturally fast person. And, you know, with the hurdles and stuff at the end of my sophomore year, I realized, like, okay, maybe I can, you know, do this. Then junior, junior year, uh, I got second in the 300 hurdles and I got second in long jump. No, no, I won in long jump. I apologize. I won in long jump. Then my senior year, I won both the hurdles, one tens and 300 hurdles and long jump. But uh, coming out of high school, I, you know, wasn't getting a lot of offers and stuff like that. So I ended up, you know, going to a junior college and that's where I met uh, Quincy Hall, which is a, uh, he was a big 400 hurdler at a junior college. It was like top, I know every year he was like top 10 in the world. So he, you know, he was in junior college with me and he's at, he was previously at South Camp, but professional now. And that journey of junior college was, I would say probably like the toughest moment because there's no scholarship. And I was in California. So I was like in a national juco where you know, you got scholarships and dorms and like that. You had to, in California, you had to like buy your apartment, you know, pay rent and, you know, find a way to get money and stuff like that. So things weren't really handed to you. So, you know, that was like a real point moment. I was like, okay, you know, like I got to figure out how I'm going to pay everything, you know, eat and also, you know, balance with school and training. And it was, I would say it was difficult when I first got there, but once, I got to hang with things, you know, I, you know, I got to balance everything out. Um, but yeah, uh, and especially the area, I mean, there wasn't compared to like, you know, just like city and stuff. We were like mainly in like a farm field or desert, you know, around like old people. So there wasn't like things to really do. So 
um, besides like playing basketball at the gym, but that's like pretty much it. But yeah, but throughout that time, it was really just school track and, you know, also working uh, to, uh, I worked at Foot Locker and she uh, uh, within my first and second year. And my junior college journey, I was able to win also the one tens, the four hundred hurdles, and long jump my sophomore year. And how I got in contact with Iowa was when they went to regionals, which was like their, you know, the meet before national championships. And they were in Sacramento, which was like four or five hours away from me. And he got in contact with me. And, you know, I was like. He was interested in, you know, in me and how I was doing it with scheduled visit. And I was like, okay, because I had offers, but I would have schools. I might maybe change that, not offers. I had schools interested in me, but they weren't, how would I say, not as serious besides like, you know, Iowa and Minnesota. That was like the schools that kept in contact with me and, you know, was planning to visit. And once I got on a visit with, I'm gone down to Iowa, I was, I would, I would say I was like very happy just with how the coaching is the, you know, also the facilities and the indoor track, but I think mainly was just the group in general, because throughout my whole life of high school and junior college, I was basically, you know, running, you know, training by myself and coming in Iowa, I was on paper, I was the slowest. So, and, you know, now obviously Jalen McConnell is faster than me, but, you know, the second fastest, uh, second fastest in that group but just you know to realize that journey of you know coming the slowest and being who I am right now it's you know it shows a lot because even when it comes to recruiting you pick the best place that's good for you obviously you know make sure things feel at home the coaching staff you know there's a lot of kids out there will pick schools because you know it's you know the school itself you know like Alabama you know for, for football you know Alabama I'm gonna be the best but you go to Alabama, you're like seven string, then how are you going to get a uh, play time? So, but yeah, uh, that's how really things got out. I mean, I have like, I had like Texas and Oregon, uh, you know, things just didn't work out with them. But, and, but I'm very happy with Iowa. And even, even if there was still a pitch, I still would have picked Iowa. So. so with like that journey and coming to Iowa, how has your work ethic through those JUCO experiences and moments impacted you not being a scholarship athlete starting freshman year? How have mm -hmm. those, uh, you know, working jobs, you know, training by yourself and having the discipline to train that, like what motivated you through that time and how did that develop your work ethic? Yeah. So come really, I'm, I'm always, a, I'm a naturally, you know, a hard worker. So even compared to, you know, sports and even in school, you know, that's, that's the, I just work on anything, even um, playing video games, you know, I want to win games or, you know, get the high kill count in the group, but um, really it just, especially with Juco, I still carry it to this day. Even I'm in Iowa, I still carry everything, you know, I'm still trying to work on, you know, being the best because my goal is to, coming out of Iowa as, you know, one of the best hurdlers or even, you know, the best athlete in the school. So, and really, I, I always carry that chip on my shoulder, like even uh, from JUCO and still pretending, you know, I'm in JUCO, even though I have all the things, but it has helped me, you know, grow as a person to look at things, you know, because there is, because I still look at others, like even kids on our team that don't have like scholarships and stuff like that, you know, they got to push and stuff like that. And, you know, I even, you know, give them, you know, help them like, like uh, help them give them tips, like, you know, how to like balance and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, I still carry that chip on the shoulder, you know, even at meets, you know, like you guys been here for two years, you know, hey, I, this is my first year at coming to Juco, you know, I'm out here trying to beat you guys or, you know, uh, be as fast as you guys. So uh, even when you come to meets, you know, when people say you came from a national junior college, people look at it as like, okay, cool. Like you work for, uh, for this and, you know, see where his progress is at, you know, I see why he's, you know, this, so, but yeah. 
So I, I have to dive a little deeper into the Call of Duty talk because obviously you're very well known for being on the track and field spectrum. But I mean, you tweet all of the time about Call of Duty. So I got to ask if, if, if it's anyone on the team, go ahead and name drop them. But like, who's your go to squad when you're going into Warzone? All right, Warzone. Uh, I mean, for on the team, I'll say Wayne Lawrence, uh, Genoa. I mean, actually, that's like my group I mainly play with. We do trios. So that's like my main go to go and Colin Jefferson. You know, he's sometimes when he plays and stuff like that. But yeah, we play that all the time. So I should have brought my PlayStation 5, but, you know, I have trials. But yeah, well, that's that's all we play. You know, once, uh, you know, I'm done, you know, running whatever season, you know, at, even if I make the team or don't, you know, that's all I'm going to be playing. So. Who do you, I mean, you don't got to throw anyone under the bus, but who would you say is the weakest link out of that group? <laughs> uh, the weakest, uh, not to throw anything, probably <laughs> Genoa, but you know, <laughs> but no, uh, we're all, we're all good. You know, um, we like, we, like I said, we play a lot, so we walk in, so we know each other and stuff like that. And, you know, we'll play. So, Yeah. You guys haven't gotten over frustrated with all the hackers that are in Warzone. You guys are cool uh, with it. Oh no, I'm not. I, I, <laughs> every time, every time we run into a hacker, especially when it comes to like I have like a double digit kill games, and you know, actually it just ends early. I'm just like, how? And you know, as a hacker, I'm just like, oh man. So one one race I wanted to ask about specifically was the indoor uh, championships and the 60 hurdle. Tight finish. What a race. But the ending, you were going so damn fast, you fell down. I just wanted to ask, like, what happened in that moment? You said you've never fallen before, but it looked like you might have taken a tumble right there. Yeah, um, that one was uh, – I wasn't – that was necessarily just me because uh, when I was coming and the guy next to me, because we were hugging, basically hugging the line, and when I had my arm up, he kind of, like, hit my arm, and it kind of unbalanced me, and I just forgot there was, like, a hill. So my foot got caught on the hill so yeah i was like even when i fell i was like man i really fell on tv like that's, that's no see like that was my next question is like is that the first thing that goes through your head is like man i can't believe like yeah it took second it was a hundredth of a second like we were all split up by like a thousandth of a second but i still fell like does yeah. that go through your head right away i mean no i didn't like in a moment i was like i fell i was like okay tap the ground i right, get up and see what place i got because i was more focused on the finish but yeah, but like afterwards, I was like, man, I really fell on TV. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> so, and, it, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But there's no. like been, even last year, me, you know, there's been a couple guys that fell at that same exact track. So I was laughing at them and I, and I did. And I was like, oh, man. So, yeah, like it's common in those indoor tracks, like at those meets where you got a little lip up from the track and then you guys will sometimes jump into a padding. That seems like a little, like a lot for mm. for spinners to do and not and like expect no like and now obviously i don't know any specifics if there have been injuries but like that is a lot for people to do slow down and like the change in, in terrain that's i don't know i don't think a lot of people talk about that and that's something i noticed right away is yeah. that ever like on the runner mind like when they like do they look at how the end of the the race is the track before they even run just to know like how the slowdown's going to be um really for me i just like i just go straight through you know once i cross the line you know i slow down just a bit so i don't like run up to the mat and you know hit my shoulder or hurt myself but i mean yeah i mean i wouldn't say we focus on that i think we just like focus mainly on a race and try to get to the line then once you cross the line it's like okay cool i gotta slow down but, you know not to slow down too much to a point you know you can maybe injure yourself but yeah i mean I wouldn't really say focus on that, but. Right. So in, in a race like that, like the indoor 60 meter hurdle, like that was, I mean, every race could be as tight as that, but like, what, what do you, like, what's your mentality like coming out of a race as tight as that? Like you didn't get as, you didn't finish as high as you like wanted to, but like you can't be split any tighter than you guys were. So like, what do you say to yourself after that result? Yeah. So even with, even with that, um, just, that was actually like my first full season of, at least my full season of indoor. So I never ran indoor before, you know, Iowa. So getting used to running, you know, just 60 meters and me being long, you know, being lanky and stuff, I'm, I'm not as quick. I know I'm a fast person, but I'm not quick. So 
within that process, you know, I learned to be quick. But um, with that, um, for a race that I really just didn't focus on it. You know, I just, I was like, okay, I just focus on my plan, you know, whatever that plan, you know, my plan was to, you know, get out of the box, you know, be at least be in a race and tack the first hurdle. And after hurdle two, usually I know if I'm going to win, uh, win the race or not, you know, fortunately, I got second because, you know, I got a long net and the guy has bigger traps than me, but Damian Thomas, but um, yeah. But yeah, even with that, I was just, I was just, uh, I was more surprised myself because 752 is like number is actually the number t- uh, 10 all time in NCAA, you know, in the 60 hurdles history. So I was, you know, shocked with that. And even 752 in general is like fast, you know, that's like, mostly what pros run. So, and, you know, if you would have asked me that in September, I wouldn't, would have said, I can't run that maybe next year, but not, you know, this year, but yeah, but a blanket finish like that, I think that was probably like, I was probably like one of the fastest within like the whole field because fifth, I mean, or is it fourth? No, fifth got was 758, which is actually fast. And, you know, first was, 51, 52, 53, 54, and 58. So it's like, man, like, that, like that's crazy fast. And, you know, because usually, because like Grant Holloway, his freshman year, he ran 758 and won. And I think the next person, the fastest person was like 7, 6. So, With, yeah. You talk about, you know, kind of game planning a little bit. How do you game plan before each meet or each competition that you participate in, depending on the event? What kind of goes into the prep and the training? Yeah, so just start off like with the week, you know, honestly, I look, I, I watch a lot of film on myself. So we record like our teammates, uh, you know, sometimes help record our hurdle races, you know, our hurdle practices and stuff like that. So I watch a lot of film on myself when it comes, cause I'm not the best technique wise, you know, as of right now. So I really like looking at everything, you know, is my trail leg tight enough? Am I snapping down? Is my, how's my arms and stuff? But yeah, I really just, you know, prepare myself within the week and on race days. I do the same exact thing, you know, um, uh, pre me, you know, we also have like a little hurdle session for me. I usually go over like, you know, box starts and do like the first, the second hurdle a couple of times and that's it. And usually, like I said, sometimes I record something like that, but I just like feel, you know, within that pre me day, you know, okay, I'm ready. Then come to race days, you know, while I'm in the box, I just really focus on just the little things really, but not too much. And just focus, I look, just focus on, you know, getting out the box, you know, being a race and because I trust my strength at the end. How do you stay mentally sharp and mentally focused during meets and competitions when things go your way and when they don't go your way? Um, with, I really, I take everything as, you know, a learning experience, you know, place as of right now, you know, obviously, you know, place does count at the same time, but I think of it as, you know, a learning experience for me, you know, even season, you know, people try to, you know, win every race, you know, I try to have a good quality race because when at the end of the day, the only race that count is when it comes to regionals of surviving, advancing and, you know, NCAA championships of trying to win. So like even at uh, trials today, you know, obviously things is, is not in my favor compared, you know, while I'm ranking within everybody, but I know as myself, I can go out there and compete and, you know, make it into that final and also, you know, a chance to make it a team. But yeah, I really just, really just don't focus on that. I just making sure I have a best quality race because if I, the best thing is I can be third and, you know, run a suit and PR. So, and I'll take that any day versus, you know, getting first place and it was a terrible race. So. So with that, you know, you talk about going into the Olympic trials, which is a super exciting and awesome thing. We talked about it briefly before we started the podcast. Yeah. What is your mentality going into it? But also just like the excitement and the environment being there, like going to Hayward Field and all that. Like, what is that experience like so far? And what are you looking forward to throughout this experience? Yeah, I've 
I've um, for years, you know, since I started, you know, watching track, you know, before, uh, you know, Usain Bolt was probably the athlete I watched. Then, you know, once I got into hurling, I started to look at like David Oliver and, you know, just watching, you know, videos of, you know, the Olympics of being there and even at Hayward Field where everybody has like their national championships and just like, man, like I want to be there. And, you know, had, you know, this past year, you know, the I mean, past couple of weeks, you know, when we had NCAA championships, it was like, man, like I'm actually here, you know, now it's like, now it's time to like perform. So, and, you know, the feeling of being in trial is like, I, I can't really explain it because it's just, I mean, I'm just excited and ready to run. Like I'm, I wish it was like within a couple hours I would have ran oh, and start running. But um, yeah, I, I just, I'm just trying to take everything in, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm a, comp you know, I'm an athlete competing in the meet. So I have to focus on that, but yeah, it's just a blessing. You know, like I said, if you asked me like September, you know, I, probably would have said, well, I wouldn't make it. So, but, and having, you know, be able to make it is just uh, exciting for me. And to make it to this point, you know, no matter what ends up happening, what does that do for your confidence and your growth as an athlete, as you're headed into, you know, you know, future events and future competitions? Yeah. Uh, this, you know, with stuff like this is making me confident because I have another year. So, Doing, I'm doing all this right now. And I was like, man, I have another year, you know, like I'm out here, you know, out here, you know, making a name for myself. So confidence is, uh, you know, a big thing for me because I coming in, like I never thought I would be doing this. And the fact that, you know, I'm doing this right now is like, okay, cool. Like I know how I am as a person, you know, and I, you know, even like I said, things have not always been my way. I can always, you know, come out and compete and do my best and actually, you know, uh, drop big times. So I've seen that you've tweeted also on your Twitter that you think track is one of the most underrated sports. How how do you mean that? Like in what in what regard? Because I honestly, I'm I'm curious with what you mean. Yeah. So track is like track is underrated compared to like you know with football and basketball even soccer so soccer is like a world you know national sports you know and, you know even with athletes uh professionalizing track and field you know the pay is not the same so you know the, i mean obviously uh there's contracts and stuff like that but you know most athletes are paid by their endorsements you know for example like you know Steph Curry, LeBron James, or even, you know, Tom Brady, you know, they're paid, obviously they got endorsement payment, but they're paid for the team they're on. There's no team for track and field. You're all by yourself. So like there's meets where you make uh, money, which is by placement. So for example, uh, Olympics, actually, the Olympics, the, if you're gonna make it a finals, you know, everybody gets paid, but the winning prize is 10K. You know, that's, you know, that's probably not a lot to like maybe like Steph Curry and all of them, but it's a lot to us. So and just like how with um, how would I say just with learning, learning the sport and actually how would I say this is a sport in general, I should say, because it's underrated because the amount of stuff you do, because people think, oh, you can go out there and just run. And, you know, if you're fast, you know, you'd be good. No, like, uh, you know, uh, for a four two two forty guy can be in the track and probably run like ten five ten three and like okay well that's not good enough because because there's guys out there that run like if they did a forty yard dash they run like ten one I mean nothing ten one me four one so like it's like a, it's a different type of speed compared to like any other sport so just so but really just with like overall um just exposure with the sport because now a lot of we're not there's not a lot of meets besides like NCAA championships Olympic trials and even Olympics you know that's the only time people wa really watch track so compared to like basketball it's on you know every day within the season so yeah and like I I, I remember vividly about what was like a month or two ago DK Metcalf took part in the, like an event and I mean he he lost by like a step or two but you could tell like there is a distinct difference between what kind of speed you need for like the foot like football being on the field, being able to take a hit and keep going and the straight line, just go speed that you see on the track. Like it is two 
distinctly different things. And for the casual fan, like whenever the Olympics roll around, you could ask just about anybody what events they love. And nine times out of 10, they'll say like those final track and field events, like the finals of any of them, there's just so much excitement that people feel when like the race before it even starts. And then everyone's just going. And it's, I mean, it's done in under a minute, sometimes done in under 10, 15, 20 seconds. I mean, it's insane. Mm-hmm. And, and people don't, like you just said, people don't really think about the fact that there aren't teams for these guys. Like they're running for, for their livelihood. Like there are, you aren't being supported in the background by like, the golden state warriors like that comparison you had with Steph. you are mm-hmm. running for yourself and that's yeah. like that's the really interesting like individual part of track and field where you are your own team like yeah you might be like endorsed and have like team nike or whatever and you might have a national team but you're running for yourself and that's like that's really interesting to hear and think about because a lot of casual fans don't think that when they watch, they just see it and they go, man, that was fast. But mm-hmm. there's, there's a totally different thought process behind that fast. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. But one, one thing like I was, I was curious about with like, and I brought up the, the, the hundred yard or hundred meter sprint in the Olympics. Like obviously one of the most iconic moments was that I think it was the 2012 in London, the four by one uh, final. I mean, that was like, unreal i think us and jamaica both set world records like that's unreal has there ever been a moment in your in your childhood upbringing whatever during track and field national championship whatever that you were like man like that is iconic to me and forever will be yeah um man there's been there's a lot you know even even with my, I would say, even with, like, my indoor, you know, 60, I mean, that's probably, like, an iconic moment, because, like I said, like, uh, fifth is, you know, was 758, and, you know, that's, a, like, probably one of the fastest field, you know, with ever in NCAAs, uh, so, but, um, yeah, I think probably for me it was probably uh, Ry Benjamin's uh NCAA, you know, NCAA record at uh when he was at USC when he ran a uh, 4702. Cause like just what like the margin he went from because coming in, he did run, he did break uh, you know, 48. He ran like 4798 at regionals, then went to NCAA uh, you know, championships within like two weeks later, then ran 4702. It's like, oh man, like that's a large, that's a large amount that he just dropped. So I think that was probably like maybe one of the iconic moments, and also when Grant Holloway when he ran a uh, twelve uh, ninety uh, eight in the uh, one ten hurdles, you know, because that was the first collegiate ever to break thirteen seconds. Oh, w- one another like kind of dumb ish question, I guess, for an entirety of track and field, but for triple and long jump, you got to jump into sand pits. Casual fan looking at it goes, it's got to be really annoying to jump into sand and get out of it every time. Like, is there an annoying factor to it, or is it that just completely overblown? Um, I wouldn't say. Uh, no, I can say there's a little bit annoying part because, like, I'm also a long jumper as well. Um, I think the fact that, like there's been times where I do the one tens and you know long jump at the same time. I was like, okay, like, okay, I got a long jump first. And you gotta go back and do the one tens. Like, okay, now I gotta get all the sand out of my socks and stuff, put on my sprint spikes, you know, do hurdles, then go back to jumping. But yeah, I would say like sand is not a really big problem. But when it comes to like, you know, getting sand out of my socks, I think that's like the real problem for me. But otherwise, that no, uh, no, I don't think it's uh really as much unless you know you're on TV, you know, you got sand and you're ashy from the, the sand. But that's pretty much it. No, I mean, it, I, I, I'm always just curious because, you know, even sometimes like there will be rain and you guys got to run in with a little rain. You got wet and sandy. Like that's the worst feeling ever in the world. I can only assume what are like your favorite conditions to run in? Like, do you like a dry heat, humid, a little cloudy, like a little mist? Like, I don't know. I'm asking for someone who runs all day. Like what is the most enjoyable now? I, I don't like, I could totally be setting myself up here for a chalk answer where you're just going to be like sunny, no cloud in the sky, just beautiful mm-hmm. day, which I could totally be cool with. But like for your own personal preference, like what do you enjoy to run in the most? Yeah, I, I probably, obviously I would enjoy running in the, 
I probably would take the heat over anything. Uh, but I think really just a perfect day, like with no wind, because for us, like, you know, 200 you know, sprinters, even, you know, short hurdlers, if you have like too much wind, it doesn't technically count as, you know, uh, like a PR for you. So I can run like maybe 13, oh, but if it's like 2.6 wind, it's like, okay, you ran it, but it don't really count as your PR because you have wind that helps you. But yeah, I would definitely take the heat. Uh, like I ran in heavy rain conditions before in junior college and also, you know, as NCAA championships and prelims day. And you know the cold as well, but I can't. I don't like being in the cold as much. So, but yeah, I'll take any hot. I'll take hot days since I've been raised in Vegas. So I'll take the hot weather any day. What are your thoughts of the Iowa winners? Um, I, I mean, I was originally born in Minnesota, so I have okay. all experience. So you're, all cool, that. you're cool with it then. All yeah, right. I'm cool. It was just with actually getting used to everything, you know, especially with snow. I think th this past year was like uh, the year I was like, okay, I really didn't like the snow this, you know, this season. <laughs> but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that's like pretty much uh, it really. But yeah, I have no problem with it at all. One thing I wanted to ask you was we talked to a lot of Iowa athletes, especially about tips and things for our listeners and for people who are either athletes in the sports that we're interviewing an athlete from like track and field or yeah. basketball or golf or something like that so if someone's trying to work on you know their hurdles or just their track speed and trying to get faster just trying to improve their game what would be some advice you'd give to them yeah so for really i'll start off with like speed in general obviously um really work on your like in speed endurance, you know, holding that uh, top speed for longer than usual. So I, uh, but mainly I think weight training is also, you know, the key to it all. Uh, like fast reps. Um, also like my favorite, you know, workout to do is like uh, hand cleans or power cleans. I think that helps me the most, but um, yeah, really just work on the speed endurance, which, you know, having like, multiple fast reps so one of my workouts I would do for was like 300s or 200s um you know run the fastest you know consistently run like 22 seconds for the 200 multiple times whether it's four or five or even you know six reps and that's that usually uh that's like probably not fast and you know people that don't know each other like 22 seconds like I run that right now I was like well can you do that eight times in a row with like maybe like two minute rest so but yeah and hurdle wise really um focus on your trail leg obviously uh attacking the hurdles snapping down I, the seven now is always the key uh to everything but really just work on just hurdle drills in general and also um just with form because without form uh you know it's hard for to go over the hurdles rather balance wise or even just you know getting your trail like through so one of the questions obviously i alluded to in the beginning was you called iowa hurdle or you and I have to dive into it a little. Iowa was the only school with two finalists in the 110 meter middle, or meter final, you and Jalen McConnell. So, like, where did that ever start? Like, did you guys just, like, come together and you guys just, like, were kick, kicking ass and you're like, hey, we're, we're hurdle you. You just kind of, like, let it happen? Or was yeah. that, like, a goal? It was a – it for sure was a goal. You know, obviously um, us and LSU is probably, like, the – rivals of like just hurdles in general you know and both the 110s and you know 400 so obviously uh indoor season there was two and you know and lsu in the final it was just, and me so obviously you know they were uh you know considered as hurdle you but on paper you know i was still no more because we had multiple people but yeah obviously uh for sure when uh this outdoor season you know me and uh, Jalen were the only, you know, two Iowans, you know, to be in that heat. You know, LSU had one guy, potentially was supposed to have a guy, but he didn't, you know, make it. But, 
yeah and even the, the thing re really like uh stated us as hurdle you regardless if you know even next year it could be just me regardless of that that out of all the guys you know J me and Jay went two and four you know like uh as in the top of my head right now I don't think you know anybody uh anybody else has you know went you know at least you know three and four or you know one and two or one and three so so are we going to expect in the near future to have like a long jump you or something or like what what's the next what's the next one there's gonna be something else on deck uh for sure i know hurdle you is still gonna continue in Iowa. <laughs> so on long jump you we're working on that so <laughs> but yeah for sure hurdle you we got a lot of guys uh you know that are coming back you know that potentially you know that have the potential to even you know make the national uh championships so and even that uh how far they are at least from me you know they're not that far so um is hurdle you is still going to be in Iowa, at least in my eyes, you know, anybody can say whatever they want, but in my eyes and, you know, and on paper, it, I was hurdle you. And like, what's it, what's it like to have guys who are that competitive pushing you who are this good at hurdles? Like Jalen is really pushing you and you're really pushing him. What's it like to have that on an everyday constant basis where you guys are obviously striving and pushing for the same goal, but guys are some hella good hurlers like it's not like it, this is by coincidence you guys are really good at this so what's that like every day yeah it's um it's very exciting because you know Jalen was the you know reason why because I've always wanted somebody that you know at least uh that can push me to be better and you know obviously Jalen coming and you know me coming uh before I came in you know he was the best uh you know, one of the best hurdles in uh, NCAA. So I think that shocked me. And also even Aaron Mallett, which is the professional that trains with us, he was there as well. So just being around that group, you know, it it shows it shows a lot, you know, because even at our hurdle practices, it it's a it's a miniature pre meet or actually meet day. So we go in, he's like, all right, like we know what are we expect in her, you know, when it comes to practice. So it helps us prepare, but yeah, like me and Jay, we also, you know, we helped each other, you know, cause coming in obviously I wasn't the best hurdler, you know, on paper, you know, but one thing, you know, got down for me and stuff like that. And, you know, he helped me with, uh, with a lot of things, you know, when it comes to technique and stuff like that. So, and I really appreciate that cause, you know, with, you know, without him, you know, I probably wouldn't, you know, been how I am today and stuff. So, and, especially from Jalen, you know, came a long way and having a season that he had, you know, it's, you know, I'm happy for him and, you know, things I've been going for. So, and it's, you know, even though it's going to be me, you know, I still got the other guys, but yeah, I just wish Jay was here one more year so we could prove it again that we can go one and two or something in the hurdles. But yeah. What have you learned from training with him and working with him? What's been something that you've learned? Um, competing, practicing that you've been able to implement either into your craft or something that you've just been able to enjoy more about the sport or something like that? Yeah, so with Jay, um, he has helped me realize, okay, NCAA is not junior college. So <laughs> I know that was one thing because he, I am, like I said, I'm not a quick guy and he's quick. So when, when first time racing him, he like threw me off. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, all right. You know, I can't think I'm, you know, the best guy on the field, really. But, yeah, he he just uh, showed me a lot of, you know, just with hurdles in general and also with um, just looking at uh, just looking at how, you know, competition is because he looks at it as, um, you know, as uh, competing, you know, and doing your best and, you know, I always go out there, you know, obviously, you know, try to do my best, but I never really think of it as, you know, at the end of my race, you know, like, okay, I don't think of it as like a learning experience. I was like, oh, I just have a really bad race. You know, I it's going to be in my head within uh, a couple of days. So, but yeah, he just, he helped me a lot. And also not just me, but also everybody else in the group. Do you have any pregame like superstitions or routines like a routine you have before each meet, like, or anything you eat, any music you listen to, is there anything that kind of 
you always have any superstitions you always have to do before? Yeah, I, obviously music is the key to everything for me. Uh, I always like to, oops, I always like to um, listen to music before uh, my meet or even when I warm up on the day of the meet. So, uh, and like with meals and stuff, I always get like, you know, Alfredo or some, or even spaghetti and meatballs. That's like using my to-go uh, food the day before I race. Uh, one, again, this is kind of like a, a weirdish question, but like, does anybody talk in the, in the starting blocks ever? Is there ever a word said amongst any of the runners or is it just like no talking amongst anyone? Oh, no. I mean, it's I have never experienced that. I know like a couple of my teammates say they experienced somebody that, you know, that that talked about, you know, like winning or stuff like that. But um, no, I have never experienced it, at least especially with college. Law. But I actually know I have experienced one moment when there was a guy and this was in high school. So there was a guy that he won like the 110 hurdles of uh, my junior year. And, you know, he, I was in a race with him my senior year. He had his ring and, you know, coming out in the box and he showing in and stuff like that in the box or whatever. So I was like, okay, cool. And I ended up beating him and was the state leader that time. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, you want to show the ring and do all that? All right, cool. Did he end up wearing it during the race or did he, like, give it to oh. someone? Oh, no, he he wore it during the race. Oh, so that, wow. yeah. that yeah. real cocky move, man. Jeez. Yeah. That probably held him back a little. I mean, not like it matters. Who cares? But yeah, obviously, you're trying to be as quick as possible. But Jamal, we can't thank you enough for coming on. Obviously, this has been absolutely awesome for everybody to hear about you and your journey. And obviously, why I was hurdle you because I think that's something that people don't know. Like everyone likes to say, "Oh, I was tight on you." Oh, I was QB sneak you. No, they're hurdle you. And that's not something everyone hears or listens about, but they should. They should start talking about it. And like you just said, it's here to stay. So we cannot thank you enough for coming on and talking. Uh, as always, guys, not the same time, same place. We will see you guys later.